This is your Tech News Briefing for Wednesday, November 16th. I'm Zoe Thomas for The Wall Street Journal. The United Nations Climate Change Conference, or COP27, in Sharm el-Sheikh, Egypt, wraps up this week. And despite past promises by many of the world's governments, the United Nations predicts that on the current path, global temperatures will rise by 4.5 degrees by the end of the century. Here's UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres speaking at the conference last week. Humanity has a choice, cooperate or perish. It is either a climate solidarity pact or a collective suicide pact. That dire warning comes a year after a UN report said rising global temperatures are leading to more extreme weather conditions. To prepare for those, the UN is working to expand a network of weather stations that act like a global early warning system. But for that system to work, it needs more data. And collecting that data comes with some hurdles. Joining us to discuss this is WSJ reporter Eric Neeler. Hi, Eric. Thanks for joining me. Hi, Zoe. Nice to be with you. So first off, can you tell us a little bit about what these early warning systems are warning us about? Well, they're really for people on the ground, just like we have a weather forecast that we get in the United States, wherever you live, that warns us of short-term things. It's going to be raining this weekend to we're going to be entering a dry spell for the summer, or it looks like there's a hurricane season with 15 hurricanes in the next three months. So there's short-term and medium-term predictions that they're working on. But it turns out in large parts of the world, these kind of forecasts just aren't available. Obviously, you would expect a lot of information to go into making these predictions. But I thought quite a lot of that data came from satellites and could then be provided from countries where, you know, these data scientists and analysts were based. Well, that is true. I mean, it's half the equation, right? Satellites provide you with a broad coverage. They can look at sea surface temperatures. They can look at atmospheric temperatures at different levels in the atmosphere. But they're really no substitute for the -the on-the-ground measurements that are really key. Things like temperature, wind speed, barometric pressure. A lot of these things they get from a little meteorological station. What's really uh, funny, I, I learned that weather balloons, launching a weather balloon is really important because it gives you a whole profile of the whole atmosphere and gives you all kinds of information. And these weather balloons just aren't available and aren't being used in many, many countries in the developing world. You mentioned weather balloons, but what else do they need to set up these data collection efforts? Well, they need training, they need equipment, they need computer software and technical know-how to take this data and make something with it. So what you do is you collect a lot of data, you put it into an existing computer model that may give you say, a seasonal look at what's coming ahead, or even just a measurement of a heat wave that may be coming in the next two or three weeks. But what you really need is consistent, high-quality weather data. And that's the problem here, that a lot of countries that we're talking about don't have the people or the equipment or the training to provide that kind of high-quality data. So what efforts specifically then are the UN and some of the nations involved with this program doing to get not just the equipment, but the people needed to collect and analyze the data? So the UN has initiated a big program. They've just barely gotten it off the ground this year at the COP27 climate summit in Egypt, where I was last week. And I was speaking with a couple of folks about that, some of the officials from the UN, but also some of the people who are going to be using that data So what they're going to do is really expand the number of weather stations across large parts of Asia, sub-Saharan Africa, and the island states in the Pacific and the Caribbean where you're really not getting much data at all. NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, they plan to train 200 people over the next five years, bring them to the United States, conferring with them and really teaching them how to use the models, how to take the models that we have now, tailor it to their homeland. Are there places where this kind of collaboration is already taking place? Sure. NOAA's already started working with the country of Senegal. This is a West African nation that's been experiencing real problems with heat and that is affecting their population, not just farmers or businesses, but the health of people who live there. So they are collaborating with NOAA on a sort of a heat advisory system that will give better information about 
heat waves that are coming one to two weeks ahead of time. Are there any other major hurdles to setting up these early warning systems? Well, who's going to pay for all this? The initial project is $50 million from nine donor countries and the Nordic Development Bank. That kind of got things going. But the officials at the UN say they want $3.1 billion over the next five years to really cover the whole planet. Who's going to fund that? The United States and the European countries, which are also being asked to pay for other sorts of environmental and climate-related funding mechanisms. Or is there a role for private industry? We haven't quite seen that yet. This has so far been a government-to-government project, but I would imagine in time that there may be a role for private industry. These are still predictions. I mean, even with an increased amount of data, how accurate do they tend to be? The short-term forecasts are getting pretty good. Seasonal forecasts have been improved even more in the last five to eight years, according to NOAA people. The medium-term forecasts that go, say, three to six months are getting better and better in the last five to eight years. And, you know, these are also feeding into larger what we call climate models, which looking years down the road. So accuracy is improving. That's being driven by better computing power and better data, and that has real impacts for how people make decisions with, say, their trucking business, or whether they decide to invest in a certain country, or even whether a farmer decides to plant now or in three weeks. You mentioned the need for funding and a lot of it coming from governments that are already being asked to fund other climate initiatives. You know, these are telling us about potential weather catastrophes. But is this data in any way helping prevent or slow climate change, which has been the UN's goal for many years now? Data is important to knowing what's coming down the road. And that's important for societies, for businesses, for people's health. So data is very important for planning. It's not going to slow climate change. It's not going to reduce the amount of greenhouse gas emissions in the air. That's only going to happen with changes in policies throughout the globe. But these climate early warning systems are going to help all of us prepare for what's coming, make decisions in the short, medium, and long term that can affect our lives, our businesses, and our families. All right, that's WSJ reporter Eric Neeler. Eric, thanks so much for explaining this to us. You're welcome. And that's it for today's tech news briefing. For more tech stories, check out our website, wsj.com. I'm Zoe Thomas for The Wall Street Journal. Thanks for listening.